All right, um, welcome everybody uh, to this month's Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative webinar. My name is Matt Schumar. I am the program coordinator for OBCI. Uh, joining me today is Jen Moore. Um, Jen is co-chair of the communications committee and Madeline Sudnick, our presenter. Um, so let's go through some housekeeping before we get started with today's talk. If you're not familiar with OBCI, I encourage you to go to our website, obcinet.org, to learn all about what we do. We are a network of conservation organizations throughout the state of Ohio and regionally. So this is a broad network, everyone from metro parks and fish and wildlife agencies to universities, natural history museums, and increasingly private business as well, um, working together to advance bird conservation. So we have a number of programs that we work on currently. So we provide landowners with information and workshops and assistance on managing their lands, uh, their forested lands, as well as working with partners in urban areas to reduce the impacts of bird building collisions. So check out our website. Um, we also have all of our former webinars. So webinars we've done in the past are archived on our website. So you can click on the resources tab and go to webinars and watch the dozens of previous recordings um, and presentations that we've gone through as well. We've got a few webinars coming up. We're trying to do this every other month. Uh, we're still finalizing the details for our May webinar, but in July, uh, mark your calendars for July 25th. We will be hosting Aaron Skinner, um, who is currently a Fulbright student researcher in Columbia, South America. Um, he recently finished up a master's project here at Ohio State University looking at uh, migration ecology of eastern whippoorwills. Um, I was fortunate enough to assist with uh, field work a couple evenings for this project, and it was really cool. Um, so Aaron and everyone involved actually put GPS transmitters on eastern whippoorwills to figure out where they're going and where they are spending their winters. So mark your calendars for that. That'll be a really fantastic presentation, and we'll be doing that in July. So just some housekeeping as we go through. This is set up as a webinar. Um, feel free to continue to use the chat. Um, but if you have questions for Maddie as um, she presents all this really great information, please use the Q&A uh, feature. So you'll find that in the ribbon um, for Zoom at the bottom of your screen or the top, depending on uh, what type of computer or device you're using. Um, if you see a question that's already asked that you'd like to ask, you can also um, sort of thumb that up and move it to the top and upvote it. Um, so use that. And at the end of today's presentation, I'll be going through those questions and relaying those to Maddie. And that brings us uh, to today's presentation. So I'm very pleased to present Madeline Sudnick, who is a graduate student at the University of Arkansas in the Durant Ecophysiology Lab. She completed her undergraduate degree at Ohio University working with Dr. Kelly Williams um, in her avian ecology lab. And she's interested in how birds interact with their environment and disease. I'm really excited about today's presentation. I was fortunate enough and, and Jen as well to see uh, a presentation uh, a few years ago of some of this research in the works at an Ohio Bluebird Society conference. Um, Maddie's a great presentation, a great presenter. You're really in for a treat today. Um, so without further ado, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Maddie. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Let me share my screen really quick. Okay, uh, everyone can see the slide and hear me? Yep, looks great, thank you. Awesome, well, hello everyone. It's so nice to see you all over Zoom. Uh, like Matt said, uh, I'm Maddie Sudnick, and today I'm gonna be talking about my uh, research on the differing effects of the environment and parental care on offspring. So, how do I shrink you guys? There we go. <laughs> now I can see my screen. Um, so, like Matt said, I am currently a graduate student at the University of Arkansas. I work in Dr. Sarah Durant's lab, and we work together on physiology, parental effects, and disease. Uh, so, my project specifically is on um, canaries and MG, or it's commonly referred to as house finch disease. Um, so I'm looking at how primary versus secondary infections influence transmission in these populations, as well as their physiological responses to that disease, how long they're sick um, and how, um, how intense that sickness is. However, today I'm gonna to be focusing on my time as an undergraduate researcher at Ohio University. 
Um, so I was in Dr. Kelly Williams's avian ecology class. I'm sure many of you have um, met Kelly. She's fantastic. Um, so I was working on um, how the environment influences um, birds, specifically offspring birds. Um, but overall, just as an introduction, there have been massive avian declines in the past 50 years. Uh, so the Americas in total have lost about 3 billion birds since 1970. Insectivorous species or birds that eat insects have been the hardest hit and they've declined in abundance by about 58% uh, since 1980. Um, and of aerial insect insectivorous species, 13 are decreasing and only three are actually stable. Um, so some of the um, factors that influence these declines um, include habitat loss. That's technically the biggest one right now. So as these habitats are destroyed or fragmented, birds have a harder time finding the resources they need um, in order to complete their full annual cycle, to survive, to uh, reproduce and create the next generation. However, there's a bunch of other um, threats to these species as well. Uh, so one of the biggest is cats. Um, so cats are responsible for 2.4 billion bird deaths in the United States alone every year. Um, also, there's chemicals. So as pesticides are sprayed, that actually reduces the number of insects available for the birds to feed on, especially those already really vulnerable aerial insectivores. Um, so that leads to about 2.7 million bird deaths per year in Canada. Um, and also collisions. So 600 million birds are killed annually just from flying into windows in the United States. And another 500 million are killed running into things like cars, turbines, power lines, um, any number of other man-made um, structures. So some of these threats, we really, we really have a handle on how to address and reduce these um, avian declines. So for instance, cats, once again, responsible for 2. Point billion bird deaths nationwide. Um, this can be solved by keeping cats indoors and reducing feral populations. So even cats that don't really look like they are contributing to these declines, and you're like, oh, that cat's not a great hunter, there's still a really good chance that that cat is contributing. Uh, so it's really important to keep these cats inside and reduce these feral populations in order to keep um, bird populations stable. Another one we are working on addressing um, is, the collision, is the collision deaths into windows. Um, so both Cleveland and Columbus have lights out programs. So lights out programs are where um, scientists will encourage buildings to turn off their lights at night during migration. So birds will see lights on at night in these cities and will fly into the city center and get confused and crash into windows and then we'll find them dead the next day um, under these buildings. So the lights out programs encourage them to turn off their lights and keep these migrating birds safe in their corridors. Um, another way we're addressing this is through the implementation of bird-friendly glass. Um, so we're currently working on that at the University of Arkansas, but other locations such as Duke have put in bird-friendly glass. So this is glass with a dot pattern on it uh, that is typically UV reflective. So birds can see in UV and humans can't. So birds will see this as an impenetrable, impenetrable barrier, which it is, but humans will still be able to see out of that window. So this can save a large number of birds from crashing into that glass and dying that way. Um, so just as a visual depiction of what we are seeing here, um, these birds are from the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, there's 2,100 birds that were collected by this museum that died in window collisions just over one year. However, some threats are a little bit more challenging to understand the implications of and figure out how to address. Uh, so on the left here, we have two house finches, one with a very swollen eye. So this is the disease I am actually working with, um, MG or house finch disease. So as house finch disease moved through, moved through the populations in the United States, it caused pretty large declines in those populations. And we are still currently working on figuring out how that is gonna look into the future. Is it gonna keep causing declines? Is it gonna stabilize? And how can we prevent further deaths? Um, including it passing to other species and causing declines in those populations as well. Um, additionally, parasites, um, we are still currently figuring out. So in areas where these parasites are native, they tend to have a less lethal effect on the birds they have co-evolved with. However, in areas where they're invasive, especially like the Galapagos, uh, bird parasites can cause massive uh, population declines there as well. 
So especially young birds that don't have defenses, uh, parasites can really um, lower those populations. So we're still working on figuring that out as well. And it's important to determine how those are going to influence populations in the future. Additionally, um, the world is losing insects at a very fast rate. Um, so this is really vital for our bird populations, especially our insectivorous bird populations, um, because they rely on these quantities of insects in order to feed themselves and their offspring. So the global index of invertebrate abundance has declined um, by about 50% in the past 50 years. And in between 20 and 100% of species within different insect groups are currently in decline. Um, so those of you who are, um, have been around for a few decades or on the older side may have noticed that over time, you're seeing less, less bugs hit your window on long car rides. Um, this is because there are just simply fewer insects to hit. So this can really cause decreases in the insect insectivorous bird population. And however, we're still working on understanding about how big that decline is going to be and how we can sort of address that to keep populations stable. And conservation is also complicated by migration. So if birds would just stay in one area and you could protect a single habitat um, and they would stay there, that would be fantastic. However, these birds move all the way across the Americas and therefore they need high quality habitat all the way throughout their migratory range. Um, so for instance, during migration, this looks like high quality stopover points. So birds on migration need locations where they can come down out of the sky and rest and refuel themselves with food from that area. And that will give them the energy to continue through this migration. Um, so if you live in Cleveland or anywhere along Lake Erie, uh, this is actually really important for your area. So as birds are coming down from Canada, they have to cross Lake Erie, which is just a massive expanse of water for these little birds. There's nowhere to land, there's nowhere to get food. So when they reach the other side of Lake Erie, they basically crash land and they need food right then. Um, so areas of high quality habitat all across that shore are really important for keeping these migratory birds healthy and alive. So these needs are different from, say, the needs of a bird that's going through its breeding season. So in addition to high quality habitat with a lot of food, these birds also need appropriate nesting sites. So if it's a cavity nesting bird, there need to be dead trees in the area for them to find cavities in. If it's a shrub nesting bird, there needs to be a good understory layer. Um, it depends on the species, but there are additional needs um, for these breeding populations. So that's what I chose to look at. Um, for my undergraduate work, I focused on early life history, which includes incubation when the birds are still in their eggs and are being tended to by their parents, and the nesting period, which is after these birds have hatched from their eggs and they remain in the nest until fledging um, later on. So during this time, they are completely helpless. They rely on their parents for everything from feeding them to keeping them warm to keeping the nest clean. Um, they can't really do anything for themselves during this period. Uh, that means that the early environment can really affect their development as they uh, rely completely on their external environment to determine how well they're going to develop. And that makes the nesting period a really critical life history stage as the development during this time can affect their adult phenotype. So whether they're going to be a healthy adult, a shy or a bold adult, it can also influence their survival and their lifespan and whether they're going to be able to produce their own offspring and contribute to that next generation. So what are some different things in the environment that affect their development? So first, as we talked about before, are parasites. So up here, the first three photos uh, are of bird blowflies. So bird blowflies are flies that during their maggot stage will feed on the blood of nesting birds. So they will use the two teeth you see in that uh, photo there to scrape away the skin until they can get to the blood beneath. Um, and this feeding can lead to things in the birds such as anemia, reduced growth rate, and even death at high enough concentrations. Uh, so on the far right there, um, that's a cage of all of the blowflies I found in a single nest during my field season. So there's about 20 blowflies in that picture. Um, so if there's about four eastern bluebirds in each nest, that's five parasites feeding on each uh, baby bird. So you can see how over time that would really add up just the blood loss from these parasites feeding um, and would cause health issues. So down here we have lice and mites. 
So the impact lice and mites have really depends on the species um, because some mites will feed on the blood. Some lice and mites will feed on the blood like the blowflies. However, others will feed on feathers or just shed skin cells, um, that sort of thing. So how much they're going to impact the bird's health depends on what kind they are. Uh, resource availability also affects offspring development. So parents need to have enough resources in the environment to provide to their offspring. And this is especially important for food. Um, so there needs to be enough insects around that the parents can go out and find them, bring them back to the nest. Um, so the birds have enough calorie to calories to continue their development. However, it's not enough just to have the sheer quantity of insects in the environment. They also need to be the right size and the right type. Um, so you can see that um, on this picture showing just a sample of insects from one of our field sites, there is a wide range of insects available for the parents to choose from. Um, and not all insects are created equal when it comes to nutrition. Some are going to be a lot more nutritionally dense and some are going to be less. Um, so it's important to have that variety there for the parents to choose from. Uh, and then back to size. So here we have a purple martin that has a much too large prey item just kind of stuck in its beak. Uh, we saw this when we were pulling down their nest to check on them. Eventually, this parent had to come remove the prey item from this baby bird's mouth and replace it with something more size appropriate. Um, so since baby birds will swallow their prey whole, they need smaller items in order to swallow that. Um, so these environmental conditions can affect parental care and the trade-offs they face. Um, so parents need to care for their offspring, bring them food, keep them warm, but they also need to care for themselves. Um, but parents only have so much energy during the day. So if they're caring for their offspring, bringing them food, keeping them warm, they also need to find time to find food for themselves, uh, rest in order to maintain their health, preen in order to make sure there's no parasites that they're bringing in on their wings. Uh, so when the environment is poor or not really good for raising offspring, that trade-off can get very intense and difficult. Uh, so just as an example of this, up here we have a graph um, between uh, the number of offspring parents are raising and their survival probability. So as parents are raising more offspring, their survival probability decreases. So they're less likely to survive the more offspring they are raising because of this trade-off. So what are parents doing to affect development? Well, there's a number of different behaviors they need to perform to keep their offspring alive. Um, so first is just nest attendance, so performing any number of care activities while at the nest. Uh, so here we have an eastern bluebird mom, there we go, here we have an eastern bluebird mom who is removing a fecal sac from her nest. Um, so this is keeping the nest clean, making sure that um, it's not detected by parasites or predators, um, and just overall maintaining the health of her offspring. On the bottom here is another example. So this tree swallow in the video we recorded of her actually flies out and attacks the wren that's on top of the box. So she is defending her nest from an intruder who could possibly harm uh, her offspring. Uh, so next is provisioning. So that's bringing back the food items to the nest and making sure those offspring have enough calories to continue to grow. Um, so they need to make enough trips to and from the nest to bring back the right quantity of prey. Um, and finally, we have nest temperature. So parents will, usually the females in our study species, will incubate eggs and brood hatched offspring. So they need to keep their temperature um, above critical levels. So between at below, below 79 degrees Fahrenheit, development will actually slow or stop completely. So parents really need to keep their minimum temperatures above around 79 degrees Fahrenheit. However, for optimal growth, they want to keep it between 100 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why if you reach into a bird's nest, it feels really warm. That's because they're trying to maintain those temperatures um, between 100 and 104 in order for these offspring to have their best development. So how do we measure development? So we can look at growth, including the size they are at fledge or when they leave the nest. And we can also look at growth rate, which is how fast these birds are growing during this time. Uh, we can also look at condition, including body condition, which is how much weight they have for their frame. Uh, we can also look at immune function, how well they're going to be able to fight off diseases. And we can look at hematocrit, which is packed red blood cell volume, and it's tied to um, their ability to 
uh, fly and exercise. Um, so growth rate, increased growth rate is related to increased fledging success. So they're more likely to leave the nest and then survive better once they've left. Uh, it's also related to recruitment. So birds that grew faster as offspring are more likely to join the population as an adult. So hematocrit, like I said, is packed red blood cell volume. So it's tied to oxygen carrying capacity and aerobic capacity. So generally birds with higher hematocrit have better exercise and flight performance. Uh, it's also related to increased reproductive success. They can have more offspring and they're better at securing breeding territory that will give their offspring the best chance um, to have a good start. So now I'm gonna walk you through the model we built to test all of our different questions here. So first we have our environmental conditions. So uh, food availability at the top here and parasites. Um, and then the arrows are representing our questions. So next is parental care, including the temperature of the nest, the time spent at the nest, and the number of trips to the nest. Finally, we have development with our offspring bird. Um, and now we have all of the different questions we are trying to test with this study. So just written out, our questions are, how does the environment influence nestling development and parental care? How does parental care influence nestling development? And can parental care mitigate impacts of poor environment on offspring development? So that was our main overarching question. So our methods. We used Eastern Bluebirds for this study. So they're in the nest for 16 to 22 days after hatching. The adults practice by parental care, meaning both the male and the female will help out at the nest. Uh, in terms of foraging, they are insectivorous and they will typically take insects off the ground and off foliage like bushes. They provide their offspring with uh, all insect prey and 42% of that prey is fed to that's fed to young is less than 13 millimeters long. So overall, the smaller food items is what these parents are bringing back to their offspring. They are currently of low conservation concern. However, Partners in Flight has recently outlined the goal of keeping common birds common. So it's a lot easier to protect populations that are still large than trying to bring a population back from the brink of extinction. So that's why we need to keep these common birds at their current levels. Additionally, common birds are really integral to healthy habitats. They provide a lot of different ecosystem um, activities and keeping that environment stable. So that's why even though these birds aren't necessarily in decline or on the brink of extinction, it's still important to monitor their reproduction and their overall population health. Um, so we monitored 109 boxes across Athens County, Ohio. Um, and there's two specific sites I wanna talk about to you today. So first is the ridges. So at the ridges, the nest boxes there were provided by the Columbus Audubon Conservation Grant. So if anyone is here from Columbus Audubon, thank you so much. We were very glad to add this uh, site to our system. Um, we were also able to partner with the MF Athens, Athens Project from the Ohio University Museum um, to create a cavity nesting bird tour. So if you go to the uh, OU Museum MF Athens website, you can click on this tour, go up to the ridges, and as you walk through this trail, uh, you can look at each box and the app will tell you what birds were nesting in that box during which years. How many offspring did they have? Were they successful in raising these offspring? Um, all this really cool information is available to you from that. So that was a really great project that we were able to collaborate on between our two groups. Um, additionally, we had the site of Little Fish. So Little Fish is the site we shared with Rural Action, which is a community organization in Athens. So they had citizen science working on a nest watch project. Um, so nest watch is a nationwide nest monitoring program from the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they monitor trends in the reproductive biology of birds. So Rural Action had citizen science out working on the boxes in that system. Um, so if you're in Athens, Rural Action is a great uh, group to get involved with. However, this program is available anywhere. So if you really want to contribute to science, you want to do citizen science, um, then you can sign up for Nest Watch on your own and just monitor the nests that are in your area. And that will contribute to the overall data set and scientists can understand how uh, reproductive biology in birds is changing over time. So now I'm going to go through each of our field methods one by one, starting with food availability. 
Uh, so we would collect food using these malaise traps out in the field. So for those of you who haven't seen a malaise trap, it's this tent looking thing down here. It works because the insects will fly into these panels at the bottom and instinctually fly upwards. So then they will get funneled through this narrowing part at the top until they get collected at the um, white collection unit in the center. So we would then every 48 hours go and collect the insects from that collection unit. Um, and move it to the next site. Um, so we would take those insects back into the lab and weigh them to get their mass. And we would also separate them by type and how large they were to get their volume and size class. Oh, and this is uh, Jamie Christie, who was very important in making sure all of these samples uh, were processed before I graduated. Um, so next for parasites. So for mice and lights, we mites and lice, we would do a uh, visual inspection of the bird and of the nest. So here is a single louse that is buried um, in the feathers of that individual. And on the bottom, that is a nest that is completely overtaken by uh, mites. So each of those dark dots is another mite that was in that nest. Um, so the longer you look, the worse it gets. So these mites can really get to very high quantities quantities in these nests. So it was pretty obvious when a nest had mites. Um, so in terms of looking for uh, bird blowflies, we would check for scabbing on the legs and the beak when we were handling them to band the birds or uh, measure their growth. So we would, and then we would also look for blowflies that were still actually attached to the body. And we had that happen a couple times. Um, but in order to get a firm yes or no answer on whether that nest had blowflies, we would search through the nest material after the babies had left. Um, so I would take that back into the lab and look for these blowfly pupa here. Um, so blowfly pupa are about the size of a couple grains of rice next to each other. Um, so it can be a very dusty game of I spy basically to find these in the nest material. Because as they pupate, they will actually grab uh, nest debris from nearby and wrap it around themselves. So they're almost more camouflaged. They look exactly like their surroundings. Uh, so moving on to parental care. So first for temperature, we monitor temperature in the nest using eye buttons. So eye buttons are dime sized data loggers that will record the temperature of the nest every four minutes. We can then take that readout back into the lab um, and analyze it with the computer. So here's a readout of just what one um, eye button over one day could say. So this female did a great job during the day of keeping her nest between 100 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so really just staying between these two markers. Uh, we can also tell how often she was at the box. So each of these increases and then a plateau, um, that shows that the female has entered the box and is currently um, brooding those offspring, keeping them warm. And then each decrease after that is where she's left the nest to go and find food or something else outside of the nest. Um, so the temperature is pretty consistent until it hits about sundown, uh, 8 p.m., where it starts to cool off a little in the nest. Uh, so next for um, how often they are at the nest and how long. Uh, we used video monitoring to determine this. So we would set up a camera every other day during the nesting periods to watch the parents coming to and leaving from the nest. We would once again then bring that data back into the lab uh, where we would watch through the films and mark when they were coming and leaving to determine how often they were there and how long. Um, and up here is Liz Smith and Jacob Morgan who were essential in um, getting through these hours and hours of footage of all of these parents at the nest. So on to development, specifically growth rate. In order to measure growth rate, we measured their tarsus length three times during the nesting period. Um, so the tarsus is this bone here I highlighted in yellow between the foot and this joint. Um, so that will grow over time as the nestling grows. So if we measure that three different times, we can actually calculate their growth curve over their whole nesting period. Um, so that's what we did and this is uh, David Spires, who was out in the field with me every day measuring these birds' legs. And finally, hematocrit. So we would take a small blood sample from each offspring bird, no more than one or two drops, and we would then fill one of these microcapillary tubes with that blood. 
I'm gonna take it back to the lab and spin it in the centrifuge to separate the plasma from the red blood cells. Um, so we would then calculate the percent of red blood cells using one of these CritoCAPS readers. So for example, this one is about 35% hematocrit. Um, so on, on the lower end. Now on to results. So just a reminder of the questions. So how does the environment influence nestling development in parental care? How does parental care influence nestling development? And can parental care mitigate the impacts of poor environment on offspring development? So we're gonna start with the first one. So we found that parasites decreased growth rate in these baby birds. So here for this graph on the bottom, we have um, blowfly presence in the nest. So here are birds where um, there were blow or there were not blowflies in their nest, and present is birds that did have blowflies in their nest. And here is the growth rate in millimeters of that tarsus growth per day. Uh, so we found that absent uh, birds in nests where parasites were absent had higher growth rates than birds in nests where present where parasites were present. Mm -hmm. Um, so we found, we also looked at the connection between the arthropod biomass and hematocrit. Um, so contrary to what we were thinking, we actually found that as there was more food present in the environment, hematocrit decreased. However, we think this could be a quality versus quantity issue. So some of these larger samples from the field, the ones that are three or four grams, um, tended to have one very large grasshopper or one very large spider that somehow made it into the collection unit. Um, so in the future, we want to dive deeper into this and look at the actual quality of the insects being brought back to the nest, um, because those super large insects aren't the ones that are necessarily being brought back. Um, so that may shine a light onto why we're seeing kind of the reverse of what we expected here. So for the next question, how does parental care influence nest development? Uh, we found that parental care was not directly associated with either hematocrit or growth rate. So provisioning rate, nest attendance, and brooding temperature all did not have a direct influence um, on that offspring development. So finally, can parental care mitigate the impacts of poor environment on offspring development? Uh, so for this question, we did structural equation modeling, um, which produces a very complicated graph of different connections, but I've simplified for it here and we'll go through it step by step. So first on the left, just like before, we have our environmental conditions, uh, starting with food availability. So we found that um, locations that had greater food availability led to parents increasing their care at the nest. So when parents had more food available to them, they spent more time at the nest, they made more trips to the nest, and they kept their nest warmer. Um, we also found that increased insect availability also increased the growth rate of offspring. So this graph is focusing on growth rate. Um, then for parasites, we found that the presence of parasites in the nest once again uh, decreased the growth rate of these offspring. However, parasites did not have an influence on parental care. So parents didn't change how much they were caring for their offspring based on whether they were parasitized. And also, once again, we did not see a direct relationship between parental care and offspring growth rate. Um, so now for hematocrit, you may have noticed that some of our arrows has, have decreased. Uh, so with structural equation modeling, it will actually tell you how accurate your model is to your system. So the stats suggested that the model was better without parasites for hematocrit. So we've removed those here. Um, so once again, in the greater amount of insect availability in the environment led parents to increase uh, their provisioning, their time at the nest and the nest temperature. And like we saw before, increased food availability in the environment uh, decreased hematocrit. And then once again, we see no direct relationship between parental care and offspring hematocrit. So onto the discussion, we saw that environmental conditions impacted growth and hematocrit. Um, so parasites did work how we were expecting them to. <laughs> um, the presence of parasites decreased growth rate just because like just because it's likely that these parasites were sequestering nutrients from these offspring through that blood. So they're taking blood, they're taking nutrients, um, and that's going to decrease the energy and the calories these birds have to put towards growth. 
Um, in terms of food, we found that decreased food in the environment directly impacted uh, offspring growth. So when there was less food in the environment, the offspring had lower growth rates. However, we did see that contrast we were expecting with hematocrit. So we do want to look in the future, once again, into a quality versus quantity issue to see whether that um, has a better explanation for why we're seeing this contrast. So parental care was not correlated with development. However, this does not mean that parental care doesn't matter to the offspring. Um, it's possible that we're not seeing this relationship because of how we collected the data. So in order for us to calculate growth rate and hematocrit, these birds have to survive until at least day six or day 10. Um, so they need to hatch from their eggs, they need to grow up to day six or day 10, and then after that we can measure them and add them to our study. Um, however, if they did not hatch or they did not grow to day 10, then we couldn't include them in our study. And if these parents weren't providing for their offspring, if they weren't keeping those eggs warm enough for them to hatch, if they weren't bringing enough food back for these offspring to grow until day 10, then they were not included in our study. Um, so basically, we excluded all of the parents who weren't good enough to keep their offspring alive. And we only included those who um, were able to keep their offspring within that healthy range, which may be why we don't necessarily see that direct relationship here. We also saw that parents altered care in response to the environment. Um, so when there was more food in the environment, parents were able to spend more time at the nest and keep their nest warmer. Um, and this is likely due to the energy it takes to find food. So if there's not a lot of food in the environment, or if there's a lot of food in the environment, it's not gonna be very hard to find that food. And you're gonna be able to get that, that food back to your offspring quickly and spend your energy doing something else. Um, so this also leads to a decreased daily energy expenditure overall. So parents in environments with a lot of food overall do not have to spend as much energy keeping their offspring healthy. Um, however, parental care did not mitigate the consequences of low food availability. Um, so when food availability was low and there was less food in the environment, um, parents did not necessarily work harder to find the same amount of food as they would have in a better environment they were constrained by the amount of food available to them. So they did not necessarily have the time or the energy to go out and find additional amounts of food in order to prevent uh, that slowing of the growth rate in their offspring. Uh, so this can be, uh, this is similar to how humans are in food deserts. So if you are a person who's living in an area that doesn't really have access to a grocery store locations to get food, you're either gonna to have to work a lot harder to go out and find that food and bring it back to your house, um, or you're just not gonna have the energy to do that and you will have less food and less ability to get the food. In addition to being constrained, some birds actually switch um, the food they're bringing back to the nest when the availability is low. So in European starlings, ideally they like to bring back these caterpillars to their nest because caterpillars are super nutritionally dense. They're great food for growing offspring. Um, however, when caterpillars have, when there's low availability of caterpillars, uh, these birds will actually switch to feeding their offspring worms. And in terms of nutrition, worms are basically just bags of soil because that's what they eat. Um, so they're really not nutritionally dense. They're very weak in nutrition. Um, so therefore, the birds that are fed worms will have lower growth rate and lower health, even though technically they're getting the same amount of insects um, as, the other, as the other nests. These ones that are fed worms will not do as well. Um, so we also saw that parental care did not mitigate the impacts of parasitism. Um, so we saw that our birds did not respond in terms of um, any sort of parental care behavior, including uh, feeding rates or temperature of the nest, they didn't increase food to parasitized offspring. And this could be due to a number of reasons. So once again, they could be constrained. There may just not be enough time, energy, food in the environment for them to increase their parental care to parasitized offspring. It's also possible that these parents didn't necessarily notice the parasites in their nest. Um, so while this seems unlikely, blowflies do spend most of the day hiding at the bottom of the nest in order to escape detection. Um, so it's possible the parents didn't know that their offspring were parasitized. So in the wild, there are a lot of different responses to parasites. So in the small tree finch, which is here on the right, 
um, they do not respond to parasites in their nest. And therefore their offspring, like our bluebirds, bear the full brunt of parasites and the negative effects of them. However, blue tits in Europe will increase the amount of food brought back to parasitized offspring, and they will also perform increased nest sanitation. And this actually protects the offspring from the negative consequences of parasitism in their nest. So the implications of our study are that resources in the environment are extremely important and parents can only do so much. They need healthy habitats in order to raise healthy offspring. Um, so parents are not able to increase their effort to improve health when their environment is not supportive of them. Um, so that's why it's really critical to provide these healthy habitats for our breeding bird populations, especially for our bird, breeding bird populations in Ohio. So if you're interested in contributing to these healthy populations, you can work with your local community groups on improving the native biodiversity in your area. There's also the Garden for Wildlife program from the National Wildlife Federation that will work with you um, to get your backyard, your community center certified as a wildlife habitat. So that will lead to an increase of native biodiversity and therefore ideally an increase of native insects. So the more insects you have in the environment, the better off these birds who are trying to raise their offspring are gonna be. So hopefully with the uh, maintenance of high quality uh, biodiverse habitats, we'll be able to protect these breeding bird populations into the future. Um, so many thanks to all of my professors who supported me throughout my undergrad, all of our research technicians who um, were on previous slides, as well as all of our funding resources, including the Columbus Audubon Society. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. There we go. That was great, Maddie. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, we can. We had a couple questions. We did have one question about um, where the estimate came from behind the cat research. So I provided some resources awesome. links um, in there so, so folks can find where that is. So if you haven't been paying attention to the Q&A box, um, check out the answer tab. There is uh, There are a couple links to resources behind all the research that goes into understanding the impacts of free range um, and feral domestic cats. We have another question from Troy Dunn. He says, not a question, but a comment, and he's looking for some feedback. Troy says, in his graduate work, he studied climate change as it affects the decline of insect diversity and abundance in grassland. In the warming plots, abundance and diversity decreased and parasitoids increased. He proposed that this trend would negatively affect food resource availability for insectivorous birds in general, and wonders if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that a decline in insects overall is going to really negatively impact um, insectivorous species, especially grassland birds, because our grasslands are disappearing so fast. Um, so any, any additional blow to those communities, I'm sure is gonna be a major hit. Which here we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, uh, type them in the Q and A box, and we'll relay them. Uh, while we're waiting, um, I have a question for you. Um, I really love that you sort of framed your presentation today with the context of overall avian conservation declines and what individual people can do um, to help offset those. I know that bluebirds are a species that many people are very passionate about. And I saw some folks that, who are members of the Bluebird Society joining us today. Um, and so, you know, people wanna know what they can do. So I'm wondering if you noticed in your work, since food is so important, um, were there any habitat features or land cover that you noticed that um, sort of related to greater success? And if, if this is something, if you have like specific recommendations for people that they, they can do aside from just seeking out things like, um, you know, certified wildlife habitat and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so with cavity nesting birds, like bluebirds especially, honestly adding, um, I know there's some debate about it in the community, but adding those boxes really seemed to help. Bluebirds were really on the decline before there was this massive movement to introduce these bird box trails, introduce birds, um, bird nests in general. Um, and this is really because a lot of our dead wood tends to be taken down these days. Like we don't leave a lot of dead stands up. There's not a lot of 
cavities for these cavity nesting birds. Um, so if you want the lovely charismatic bluebird to hang around, really adding those bird boxes um, is super important. And if you're looking for some sort of habitat um, area, they tend to do really well on like forest edges, but like if they have access both to forest and to open field, um, that tends to be, this, is, this isn't any sort of analysis, just from, sure, yeah. from my own observations. That seems to be where they're doing the best. Um, also putting predator guards on those boxes is a massive help. Um, it yeah. won't necessarily stop the deer, but it will stop things like raccoons um, if you put a, buff um, a buffer for those offspring. Um, yeah, um, yeah, thanks. It's great to hear all that. Um, if folks are interested in learning more about all of that stuff with nest boxes, you can go to our website, obcinet.org, and we have a section on cavity nesting birds. It'll take you to some great links. Um, Cialis.org is a really good one, and the Ohio Bluebird Society has lots of really great information and recommendations on their website. Um, did you notice parasite loads changing at all with respect to some of the habitat features? Habitat features. Um, habitat features, not so much. I didn't super gotcha. look, I didn't look into habitat features specifically in my work. Uh, we honestly just didn't have the time or the resources. Um, yep. But what I did notice is that uh, year and weather really influences parasite loads. So my whole yeah. project was supposed to be about bird blowflies. Um, yeah. However, in my second year, it was really rainy. It was really cold at the start of the summer. Um, I don't know if you guys remember like that 2019 spring summer. It was just very wet and cold. Um, yep. So we didn't have basically any bird blowfly show up until very late in the summer. Um, so obviously I had to switch plans there, but weather is a, has a major impact on these parasite loads. Okay, great. Thanks. So we do have a few more questions. Um, yeah. Willie really just wants to acknowledge the wonderful work that you're doing and, and thank you. Uh, so a yeah. shout out from Willie. <laughs> um, Darlene Selleck, you know, I, I thought Darlene might have a comment here uh, in the Bluebird Talks. It's great to uh, see you here, Darlene. She says, great to hear about your research again. In Martins, we do nest changes partway through the bird's nesting cycle and it helps to reduce the heavy insect loads. They've also done that uh, in Bluebirds and Tree Swallows. Um, yeah, great to hear about your work and she would love for you to share your email address yeah, uh, if you can it. there. Yeah. yeah, that's a great thing to be able to replace the uh, purple martin um, purple martin nest material um, in order to prevent those parasites. I know purple martin people love their purple martins so much, so I'm, I'm glad you're able to support them. Yeah, uh, one, one more question here. Did you address house sparrows at all? Um, uh, so we, we addressed house sparrows by removing them from our field mm -hmm. sites. Um, so house sparrows were a problem at our field sites. So we had multiple offspring and adult bluebirds that had their faces ripped off by house sparrows. Um, so we did lose quite a few nests to that. Um, so unfortunately, the, the way we addressed them was to remove them from the system if we could. Otherwise, yeah. just they're just a part of that environment now. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. And I know this wasn't a formal analysis or, or if you had enough variation across your different sites to address it, but for, did you have a gradient of places that had different numbers or of house sparrows? And if so, did you notice parasite loads and any relationship with house sparrows being present? Um, did they introduce higher rates of parasites into the nest if they were trying to get into nests more frequently? I don't think we would have necessarily had a, we didn't run any analyses on this. I don't think we would yeah. have had a big enough gradient. Uh, most of what I noticed is that um, at say the, the more, I don't know, cosmopolitan, I guess the word I'm looking for. So like at Dr. Williams' house, uh, it was a more open field and that one had more house sparrows present. And generally we had more issues with house sparrows there. However, I don't think I could connect it to the parasitism at that site. Okay, yeah, cool, just curious. Um, thanks so much. I think that is it uh, for all of our questions. So again, I just wanna take a, a, an opportunity to thank you for joining us from Arkansas today to present the work that you've done. Um, it was really cool and it was great to see 
so many different organizations in Ohio working together and um, a really great undergraduate research project. So um, thanks again, Maddie, so much for joining us today and for sharing your work. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate OBCI having me on. <laughs> great. Thank you all uh, for everybody joining us live today. Um, if you go to our website, we do have a couple events coming up. Um, I'll be presenting tomorrow for the Lloyd Library in Cincinnati, talking about some of the things that Maddie presented here, how to make your homes and yards uh, better for birds with native uh, vegetation. Um, so check out our website for that. And then Harvey Webster will be talking for the Western Reserve Land Conservancy about our Lights Out Cleveland project. So both of those uh, links are available on our website in the events tab. So um, check that out and sign up for our newsletter to find out about future webinars like the one Maddie presented uh, here today. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.